John saw a city that could not be here. John saw the city, oh yes he did. John called a glimpse of the golden throne. Tell me all about it, go right on. Around the throne he saw the crystal sea. There's got to be more, what will it be? I want to go to that city he saw, New Jerusalem. Did not see night, the Lamb of God, well, must be the light. He saw the saints worship the great I Am, crying, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. I want to go to that city he saw, to Jerusalem. Just to 
sing this with me. I know a lot of us have had to put a lot of trust in Jesus, and I hope we do it every day, not just when things go bad. Sing this. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I try to win the
we look at things, the way we a relationship with God, sing this with me. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. my God, a heart to set set free, a heart that always feels thy blood so freely for me, a heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good. A copy, Lord, of thine. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. with me amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that bald with blood wholehearted me my soul undeserving God you're so good God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Behold the cross and age to age and hour by hour. The dead are raised, the sinner saved, the work of your power. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good too. So Sing that one more time. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. 
so good to me. Thank you, Elise, and he did. Would you please stand as we read verses 26 through 30? And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this, your word this morning. We pray that it will come alive to us in a new way. Even if we're here and we know all about this passage and we know all about what it means, I pray that we will still listen and think and allow you to penetrate our hearts with these words. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All across our nation, we have very meaningful memorials. And you might have been to some of them. You might have been to the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument the Vietnam Memorial. Uh, there's memorials right here in our own community of things that people have done and things that represent important people. As Christians, we have our own memorial. And some churches uh, participate in this every Sunday. Some churches do it once a quarter. Some churches do it every fifth Sunday. But that memorial is a memorial that reminds us of the death of Jesus Christ. We remember His sacrifice we celebrate the forgiveness that's offered to us through Him and provided for us by Him, and we look forward to His return. That memorial is symbolized by two simple elements, bread and juice. In some churches, bread and wine. It's a memorial to Jesus Christ in remembrance of Him. And I have just found it through the years very important, at least once a year, to preach a sermon about communion just so that we're all reminded how significant it is and how important it is. Communion is an ordinance of the church. What that means is it's a command that the Lord gave us to do. And the other ordinance, as we said, is baptism, which we participated in this morning. In both of these ordinances, we are seeking to be obedient to what the Lord told us to do. But more than that, we are joining believers of every flavor meaning every denomination around the world who are taking communion today. This is something that unites us. We all come to salvation the same way. We're all saved through Jesus Christ. We may have a different label above our door. It may say Presbyterian. It may say Episcopalian. It may say Catholic. It may say something else. It may say Baptist. We have different views of baptism, and we have different views of exactly what uh, the Lord's Supper means. We have different names for it. Some churches call it the Eucharist, which means the great thanksgiving. And some churches just say the Lord's Supper. And some churches say communion. And there's probably other names for it too, but those are the main three. But we are reminded that we gather around the table of the Lord and we each gather level. At the foot of the cross, Jesus died. He paid the debt that we owe. He rose from the dead. He did it for us because all of us, regardless of the title that's on the door, we're all sinners. I've shared this story before, but one of the reasons this is so important to me is because when I was younger, coming up in church, I might have been 12 years old, and I was standing out in what we call the vestibule, and we were having communion that Sunday. And in that particular church, it was always kind of spooky because they draped the communion elements with a cloth. And it looked like a dead body up there. And I guess that's appropriate because we're, we're thinking about the body of Christ that was broken and died uh, for our sins and the blood of Christ that was shed. But I remember this couple coming in. I can, I can still see this vividly in my mind. And they came to the door of the sanctuary and there were windows in the doors just here, you know, kind of whatever, not triangular shaped, but some kind of shape. I don't, I don't remember geometry very well, okay? So... Anyway, there were, there were these holes in the door, and they looked in, and the woman said to the man, oh, it's just communion, let's go. And at 12 years old, I thought, there's something wrong with this picture. It's just communion, let's go. And they turned and left. 
They got the Kentucky Fried Chicken that day before everybody else did, I guess. But I want to say to you, and I firmly believe this, there is something supernatural that happens when we partake of communion. Now, if nothing else, the thing that happens is we are being obedient to Jesus Christ. So when you are taking communion, if you are taking it in the right frame of mind, if you have examined yourself and you are doing it with the right thought processes, you are in the will of God. So ever one, am, I been, am I in the will of God or not? You are in the will of God when you're taking communion because that's something Jesus said to do and it's something that you are doing. It's more than just communion when you see it for what it is. It's an invitation from our Lord to come to the table with Him. We're gathered in His name. He's with us. We're with Him. We're united in that moment, and there's something spiritually powerful about doing this together. In the early church and in church history, they they talked about the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. All that means is that God is working through this supper to strengthen us In our faith. That's all it means. God is just using this in a way to strengthen our faith. And then you think of the word communion, and I always think of common union. It's something that unites all of us with all of our many differences, with all of our different political ideologies and all of our different maybe theological differences, and we all have various views of things. This unites us around what it's all about the body and the blood of Christ. So first of all, we remember His sacrifice. In this passage here, Jesus is eating with His disciples, one who would sell Him out to the enemy and who would eventually go out and hang Himself, one who would deny that He even knew Him three times, and the rest of them who would scatter and flee and run away from Him, and He would go to His trial on His own. And as He eats this meal with them, He takes the bread and passes it to them and says, Take, eat, this is my body. Now in John's Gospel, a couple of times before we ever get to the Lord's Supper or the celebration of the Passover with His disciples, Jesus tells people, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. He said, this is my body. And certainly His body would be broken as it was beaten, as He was harassed, as he was spat upon, as he was made fun of, as he was cursed, as he was mocked, as he was made to carry the cross, and as he was eventually nailed to that cross through this painful and humiliating way to die, Jesus said, I love you, I love you, I love you. Now, I was tempted not to preach this this morning. I actually have another sermon. I prepared three sermons this week. I was so proud of myself. (laughs) I have another sermon. I'll preach it next week. The reason I didn't want to preach this was because I thought, this is so simple. Everybody knows this. This is so elementary. This just seems like they think, preacher, did you not even study and prepare for a message this week? This is something that your grandson could stand up here at three years old and preach. But then yesterday... It seemed like every article I read was about communion. I had emails coming about communion. I had people talking about communion. I went to church somewhere else last Sunday, and we celebrated communion. So I thought, you know what? I think I'm just going to go with my original thought. That's usually a smart thing to do anyway, and just stick with this message. To talk about the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins, even for those who would forsake Him on the night that He was betrayed He's sitting at the table with them. He knows their hearts, but he'll go to the cross anyway. And Isaiah, many centuries before, prophesied in chapter 53 that he would be humiliated. He would be wounded, but he would still be obedient. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus is celebrating the Passover feast with His disciples. And during the Passover feast, the host of the feast, in this case it would be Jesus, He would take the bread in His hand and He would say, This is the bread of affliction which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. The host meant that one 
symbolized or represented the other. The bread represented the affliction. Jesus flipped that. He changed the significance and the emphasis from looking back to looking forward to what was about to happen to the redemption that would be found through His death. If you've ever been forgiven of your sins, this ought to mean something to you. If you want to be forgiven of your sins and you're not quite sure how that's ever going to happen, this can mean something to you because I'm telling you this morning, Jesus is offering you forgiveness of your sins. All you have to do is come and ask. I don't know why people get so upset about talking about Jesus. They'll be, oh, don't shove your religion down my throat. I'm not shoving religion down your throat. I'm just sharing with you, would you agree that you've made some mistakes in your life? I've, I've met very few people, I've only known of one, who said, no, I've never made any mistakes in my life. I don't have any regrets. And that one was not somebody I know personally. It's somebody I heard in an interview. But most people will say, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I've thought bad things. I've said bad things. I've done bad things. Then all I'm saying to you is that there is a man named Jesus who was the Son of God, who came into the world to be the sacrifice for your sins, and all you have to do to receive forgiveness and to know that you have eternal life is to put your dependence, your reliance upon, your, your trust in Him that when you die, He is going to take you because He's taken your place on the cross, took your punishment, and He's going to take you to heaven. That's all I'm offering to So why is that offensive to you? The only reason that could be offensive was because you don't want to admit that you're a sinner. I don't care to tell you I'm a sinner. I need every drop of blood that Jesus could provide for my salvation. But it only took one drop, and he died to pay that price. I read one writer who said, We come to the table knowing that we crucified Jesus. We broke his body. Our sin shed his blood. The... Regular act of eating and drinking the destruction that our sin has wrought will penetrate our hearts better, far better, than the most cogent lecture on depravity. Another writer said, These elements are designed to call to mind His painful and shameful death on the cross for our sins. So imagine sitting at the table with the Lord, sitting across from you, recognizing that His sacrifice was for you. His body was broken for you. His blood was shed for you. Somebody said one time, a meal is better when you're hungry. Communion is better and more meaningful when you take some time to think about what it represents. You don't just go through the motions. You don't just show up and say, oh, it's communion. Oh, they're passing the plate now. Let's get our little wafer. Let's get our little juice and take it and go out into the world no different. We think about it. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Romans 5, 9 says, Being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. That brings us to the next point. We celebrate forgiveness. In verse 28, Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, or for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the Old Testament precursor to this is the Mount Sinai covenant meal in Exodus 24, where Moses sprinkled the sacrificial blood, and he announced, Behold the blood of the covenant. Then he climbed a mountain, and he communed with God, and he drank a fellowship cup with God. Jesus says now, This is the new covenant, the covenant of my blood that will settle it once and for all. Your sins will be forgiven. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There is no remission of sins. As part of this new covenant, our sins are atoned. The sacrifice has been made once and for all. Hebrews 9.28, Jesus, once and for all, for the sins of many, offered Himself. Such forgiveness is so powerful... Because here you have offended God, and God in the flesh, Jesus, welcomes you 
to his table. I think the perfect illustration of this is Peter. Peter denied that he knew Jesus three times. And there is a time when Peter is reinstated, and he's reinstated over a meal. Jesus has breakfast for the boys on the beach when they come back from fishing. And it's there that he communes with Peter, and he gives Peter, in a sense, a chance to examine himself, although I think Peter's already been examining himself. And he asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? In, on the night of his betrayal, he sits down to eat with these guys and he lets Judas leave because he knows what Judas is going to do. And on the time when he's arrested, during the time he's arrested, when Judas approaches him, Jesus says to Judas, Friend, what are you doing here? He calls him friend. He's just sold him, turned him over to the authorities. Such forgiveness. Revelation 3.20 talks about how he, will, how he will dine with us if we'll just open the door when he knocks. He sets a meal before us, though we don't deserve it. We need to celebrate forgiveness. Now, very quickly, if you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. 1 Corinthians 11. 27 through 30. This is Paul's talk about communion. He says, Therefore, ever who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Paul says that when we eat this bread, we need to examine ourselves. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means you need to examine your faith. Are you trusting Jesus Christ for your salvation, or are you trusting yourself? That's a good question. Something we ought to ask ourselves every day. Reminding ourselves of grace. You need to examine forgiveness. Have I truly gone to Christ and asked Him to forgive me of my sins? And is there anybody I need to make amends with? And as you examine yourself before communion, you might think of somebody. Yeah, Joe, I need to, I need to ask Joe to forgive me. And I think it's okay when you say, Lord, help me to remember that. I need to do that today. And you take communion and you go out of here and you seek to find a way to ask Joe to forgive you. You examine your conscience. That means you soberly remember your sin and what it cost. And you see, is there anything between me and the Lord right now that I need to lay out, lay down, get rid of before I take communion? We humbly remember His forgiveness and we eat in celebration. The Heidelberg Catechism Ask the question, for whom is the Lord's Supper? And the answer is this, for those who are truly sorrowful for their sins and yet trust that they are forgiven for the sake of Christ and that their remaining infirmities are covered by His passion and death and who also earnestly desire to have their faith more and more strengthened and their lives made more holy. And by the way, there was a time in church history where if you wanted to be a member of the church, you memorized that answer. Every word of it. And now if you say, could you memorize John 3, 16? Well, we're not going back there anymore. They just require too much. <laughs> We'd have never made it back in the day. None of us would have been church members. Are you trusting Christ alone? Are you seeking Him daily in relationship? Are you living a life of faith and repentance? Is there some area you need to surrender? Again, think about the blood. Roman, or excuse me, Revelation 1 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. May that cup have more significance to you today than it's ever had. Revelation 5 9. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people. And nation. We finally, then, verse 29 of Matthew chapter 26, we look forward to 
His return. Jesus talks about we, He won't drink of this cup anymore until He drinks of it anew in the kingdom. Paul talks about every time we do this, we remember the Lord's death. We proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. There was hope. There was hope that He would return and fellowship with them once again. The broken body and the shed blood wasn't going to be the end of it. He was going to return. There was hope. There is hope. Christ is coming again. Next Sunday, I hope to preach that other sermon, which is about in the days of Noah. What was life like in the days of Noah? Why is that important? Because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. Now people always love to hear prophecy. And uh, that's going to be our attempt at some of that. But we're in those days, as somebody just whispered, yes, we are. We are. Believers are going to participate in something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Paul said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. That word proclaim means to witness. It's a picture of the gospel. You are signifying your belief in what this represents. Just when you go through the waters of baptism, you are signifying your belief that Christ died so that you could have a new life and that you are being buried to your old life and you're being raised to a new life just as Christ was dead and buried. But we're also being reminded in the communion that He will come again. Bob Russell told the story of being, living in a community during the Vietnam War. And he said there was a family in that community that had their Christmas lights still up in February. He said, you know, as January came and went, we're kind of thinking, why won't these people take their Christmas lights down? Their Christmas lights are still up. Maybe we need to go over there and see if we can offer to help them take them down until one February evening as he was coming home from work, he saw a sign that said, Welcome home, Jimmy. Jimmy had been serving in Vietnam. And the family left the Christmas lights up burning in anticipation of their son's return. Each time they looked at the lights, they remembered Jimmy and they remembered with hope that he was coming home. And they were going to have a late Christmas, but they were going to celebrate the best Christmas because Jimmy was going to be home safe and sound. Every time we eat the bread and drink the juice with the body of believers, we are looking forward in anticipation to one day when we will sit down at the table with Christ. And all this will just be a memory. And we'll be with Him for eternity. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to ask the question this morning, a very serious question. Do you know the forgiveness of sins? Have you come to a place where you have asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins and to be your Savior? We're going to have an before we have communion, if there's anything you need to pray about, you can come and pray. You can come and talk to me. I'll pray with you. Be happy to do that. If you want to make an initial profession of faith, I've never placed my trust in Christ. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners, that every single one of us were born into sin. That means that we were born with a bent to sinning. You don't have to teach a baby how to be bad, they learn that on their own because it's inside of them. We think bad thoughts, we say bad things, we do bad things, we don't show love to our neighbor, all those things, they're sin. And the Bible says that because we're sinners, we deserve to spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. But because God loved us so much, He provided a way of escape, He provided a way of salvation and He sent His Son into the world to take the punishment that we deserve away from us and take it upon Himself. But we have to come to Him and ask Him 
to forgive us of our sins. And if you come to Him, it's because His Holy Spirit is drawing you to Him. So every time you reject that sense on the inside of you that you need...